Hey everybody, I wanted to ask you guys today if you consider yourselves to be good learners. Are you effective at self-learning? Do you ask the right questions and, of course, make effective observations? Learning art is really hard after all, and I do see a lot of constant attributes of students that are, are consistently growing and those that are constantly stagnating. And I can relate, though, because I remember... When I was stagnating as a student, I often thought it was purely from my technical skill. Like I couldn't draw or paint a picture as well as I wanted to. But there's actually a lot more to that. There is more than simply consuming the next tutorial and then trying to implement it. And that's what I'm going to go over today. I'm going to go over the three phases of self-learning for artists and creatives. I'm going to show a lot of examples. We'll look at some infographics. And of course, stay till the very end. And I'm going to give one of my game-changing tips that really help uh, myself take my art to that next tier. So hey everybody, if you're new here, I'm Tyler Edlin. I'm a professional artist and instructor. I'm working for clients like Blizzard and Epic Games, and I teach at schools like CG Master Academy as well as my own Brush Sauce Academy. So I'm in the educational field, you know, pretty heavily, and I'm still learning. And you know, from the students that I'm seeing all the time and, and my own artistic journey, which never ends. It never ends no matter how much experience you have. It, you're always learning new things and want to progress further. And that's a thing. But I've covered in, in the last few videos the simple act of learning something creative or, or even skill-based to a degree. Uh, you can get a lot of mileage by implementing, by doing, right? But there is this whole other side of that equation or of the coin there where if we kind of implement the right kind of practices and, and mentally kind of tune in to what we need to articulate, we'll be able to get even more gains and improve you know, on, a, on an even greater level uh, than just simply by mindlessly doing. Because right, mindlessly doing will only go so far. And I know in particular, like when I was a student, I often had tunnel vision. You know, I would always just focus on the next thing, working on the next portfolio piece, building the portfolio just to get to the show, then working on the next portfolio after that to land a client. Like I was always focused and fixated to a degree where I wasn't necessarily networking the way I should. I wasn't articulating the information that I needed to to really grow at a greater uh, range. And so, yeah, it has been a roller coaster of going up and down for me learning. And now, of course, 17 years later, in 2023, as of the recording of this video, the landscape has changed quite a bit. There's different opportunities. There's different ways we kind of consume media. And, of course, how everything is all connected is quite a bit different as well. But what really hasn't changed all too, too much is this cycle of learning. And I'm just simply going to label it, you know, we learn, we unlearn, and then we relearn, and then we learn. And we're going to get into the meaning of this, you know, throughout this whole video here. But essentially, this is kind of what it is. We're taking in information, right? There's a lot of input. We have to sift through that input, kind of come to a conclusion on that. Maybe if we find something we disagree with or we learn something contrasting of that, right? We have to unlearn part of, you know, letting something go and then reformulating how that goes. And then, right, we repeat that cycle. So this brings us to our first phase of self-learning up here. And here's a few big takeaways that I'd like to include uh, and that I feel are important, of course, with this, right? We have to be curious. Uh, we have to be resourceful. And with that, of course, we need to be able to extract information. So if we're doing all of that on our own kind of personal plans, right? Knowing ourself, right? And how we can min-max our own schedules. Uh, then, of course, we can focus on what we, we learn best and the duration for which we do. And we can, of course, get into that flow state, which I've talked about numerous times on this channel. And so I do strongly feel asking and phrasing nowadays the the right kind of questions is like 90 percent of the work because then we're we're going to get the wrong answers or we're going to find a rabbit hole of wrong information if we're not starting out with the right set of questions all right so students that are asking the most questions typically do the best now i'm just going to show a few examples here from my student from last terms ashley's work she did a great job and i'm just going to sh show a general 
sense of questions that I get in the first and the last week of classes. And I want you to try to pay attention and notice the difference in those questions and how they'll shape not only the conversations, but the trajectory of what you know a student might take away leading into the term and then transcending beyond the term, right? So typical first questions. All right, so questions like, do you have any exercises or warm ups that you like to do before starting work? Do you have any advice for getting the most out of this course? That's one of my personal favorites. And do you ever experience imposter syndrome or does it ever go away? Well, the short answer on that is, yeah, I experience that all the time. And in my experience, it never goes away. So right, these questions are going to prep a student pretty well for the upcoming term. Moving into the last week of class, right? These cl these students might be going on to different courses. They might be taking a lot of time off. They're going to reflect and prepare for that next leg of their journey. So, right, so great questions in the form of like, is there anything that you found that makes an artist stand out when looking at their portfolio? Uh, do you feel that networking and connections is the most important aspect of finding an industry job? And, you know, I heard a lot of artists are not charging what they're worth, especially when they're starting up. Do you have any tips for pricing your work? Right, so these are great questions. And when they come in at the right time, it's gonna mentally prepare students so that they'll be able to prepare and tackle that next challenge, you know, in their artistic journey. And of course, there's other kinds of questions as well. And these are very important as they can affect our mental state. And of course, these come in the form of disempowering questions and empowering questions. These can totally cripple us if we let them get the best of us. So we have to do our best to not take a trip to negative town and to constantly empower us. So right, disempowering questions are like, am I good enough? Does anyone like my stuff? Do I have what it takes to succeed? Am I too old? Am I too young? Am I too thin? Am I rich enough, right? And how come nobody ever helps me? Again, these kind of questions really kind of hinder our creativity because we're so fixated on all of these negative aspects. I, I know from time to time, I certainly take a trip there. And I think that's what sets me up as a professional compared to me as a student was that I've learned how to manage these emotions and not let them run out of control because we're all human right at the end of the day. And they, they are going to come up realistically. Of course they are. But you know, what I've had to do is temper them, you know, I get them under control because they will. If, if, we, if we don't pay attention, right, they'll sneak back and they'll bite us. They will. And I keep you up all night, kept me up all night. I know that when my kids don't. Um, and of course, what we want to focus on is our empowering questions, right? How can I make the most of this day? How can I make it productive? What do I really love to do? Am I spending my time, you know, appropriately? What kind of action can I take today that will move me closer to my goals? What is holding me back, right? These are very powerful questions and they charge me up every week when I'm trying to tackle the next aspect of my career, when I'm trying to expand my business. These are what I come back to. So guys, hold that thought for a minute. A lot of those questions I just went over would make fantastic videos all in themselves. So if you guys want any answers or my take on them, just let me know in the comments below. I'd be happy to start uh, building a video with them. So I believe the next thing on my list was extracting information, right? So we're, we're curious, we're getting lots of information. Now we need to kind of properly extract it. So I have an example from a student from this prior term. Uh, he did a great job, Jonathan did. And what I train the students to do is to, to set their own goals, their own expectations, and, and to start to train them to art direct themselves, right? Like, so if you could train someone to art direct, and if you get into the habit of art directing yourself, it'll bring upon uh, a lot more success and structure to your, your studies and your projects. So he's finding, of course, all these beautiful animated uh, sort of uh, visual development pictures. He's really making a nice bulleted list of what he wants to extract from them. And then, you know, for the rest of the term, when he's going into weeks, like uh, four or five, and six and seven, he knows on a visual uh, note, you know, what he wants to do and where he's going with them. So he could tackle any subject matter, you know, from trees to interior design, to shape and form language, uh, to vehicle design, right? It's all a step-by-step -step process. And once we kind of figure out where the boat's going, you know, we'll know how to get there a lot better. 
instead of just kind of taking to the open seas. All right. And so the last part that I wanted to touch upon in, in regards to uh, self-learning is, of course, how we know ourselves in regards to optimizing our own training and schedule. So I know what I like to do personally, you know, from the time I was a very student, even till now, if I have a set block of time, let's say three hours, right, like here, I'm going to break that up so I can do both short term work and long term, right? So long term being like portfolio development personal projects, things that take more than a day or a single sitting to do, right? Whereas if we do the fast stuff, right? Like quicker kind of studies, things like practicing and playing, these are very important. And I feel like you got to find and ulti ultimately curve that proportion when you're studying. So for, for a beginner, I think more practice, more play, more observation and less portfolio work because it doesn't make sense if you're building portfolio and you don't really know the fundamentals so right like as you get experience over the course of like let's say a year gradually do less of the practice practice and more of the portfolio but you know just slightly kind of curve that and of course i do have a handy little time sheet here it, depending on how much time you have uh, developed to your studies per week you could kind of figure out a nice break down for you all right so again once you know yourself you can optimize your schedule it is a fantastic way uh, to start uh, you know improving your mental game of <laughs> improving your creativity here so next up is critical thinking it's a massive phase for us self-educators here and i think particularly for us creative people i assume most of you are, are, are creative people it's really hard to be creative and continue to grow in a creative way without critically thinking and analyzing you know all the information we're taking in all the work you know we are in fact producing and essentially it's a form of pattern matching we are constantly taking in information and of course, having to relearn that, you know, and, and connecting dots between one batch of information to the next and finding our own sort of objective truth and in, in what works really well for us. And it could be as simple as simply asking ourselves a series of questions when we're, we're working. You know, what, what can I do better next time? What should I avoid? What is working here and, and why is it working? And that's a really great way to measure, you know, if we are in fact improving. So first up, of course, this in topical reading, comparing and contrasting different sources, right? Here's some of my favorite YouTube channels and creators, stuff that I love to go to, of course, from, you know, my buddy Clint at Swatches to, of course, Marco Bucci and like everybody else, Feng Zhu, everyone in between. I love these guys and I'm constantly taking in information. But of course, sometimes some somebody will say something that really clicks with me. Sometimes somebody will be at odds with somebody else on the platform. That, that's, that's normal. But what I love to do is just process it, take my own notes and kind of find my own objective truth. What resonates with me personally. And, and the only way I find that out, of course, is by trying a bunch of things that you know everybody says, because obviously if it's working for them, it, it, there must be some truth there. But again, objective truth is a loaded term. But I try to, you know, for me, just find what works the best, you know, in regards to my process. Uh, you could think of it as like kind of connecting your own dots, you know, to find your truth. Okay, I like what this guy says about this. This this artist really uses color the way that that works for me. I'll, I'll kind of you know analyze and bracket that information and and implement it on the next painting it's just like little things like that and if we're kind of talking now about like getting critical with our own work this is again kind of exercises and stuff that i do and i have my students do right and that's like you know if we're going to take a really complex picture you know like craig mullins is here how can we really dissect it how can we deconstruct it you know like we're deconstructing references here we're just de deconstructing art deconstructing is a huge part of growth so i can like okay how what is the value structure what is the shapes what are the rhythms what is the focal point what is this the darkest value and how much of that value is in the picture D is it shape based is there a set line formation or there are patterns like really getting into breaking 
down imagery so that we have a much stronger uh, comprehension of what we're trying to articulate ultimately at the end of the day, right? It's a whole part of analyzing in, in our journey. And a lot of artists don't do this enough from the students that I see in, in, in discords and, and of course my own students. Here, um, you know, Zhao Fang, she does an awesome personal challenge. This is another great example. She does this every year. She takes an older piece and she repaints it all from scratch. And, and this is one she just did. So of course here, she's trying to make the, the angle, right? A lot more dynamic. She's all, you know, getting a lot more subtlety in the, in the pose. And of course she's pushing the hue shifts when it comes to color temperature. Uh, a lot of nice subtlety that this painting on the right is and compared to what the old was doing. So this is from my, my other student, uh, Tony, and he's been working on this whole world building project and we've been breaking it down meeting after meeting and he's doing great with it. He, he's following the process and he's learning a lot about how to kind of set up this little civilization. And of course, after the first round of feedback, he, he, he started doing a lot more to implement some of these smaller aspects that were missing. But, you know, without that, you know, but without really analyzing it and, and trying to breaking down and asking, you know, lots of questions and, and trying to figure out, you know, how just everyday life works, how function works, how we can blend two different design languages to, to really mix like Egypt and, and steampunk together. Uh, you know, we, we, it really takes just taking a step back sometimes, slowing down, getting some help if, if you need be. And of course, finding additional cross references so that things can be properly implemented on that next iteration. So take notes, guys, that, that's the big takeaway here is take lots of notes and try to troubleshoot it from a problem solving standpoint. And guys, I just wanted to give a little shameless plug here. Uh, the Brush Sauce Academy is now up to three mentors, including Zhao Fan here. And if you need help with illustration, fundamentals, or concept design, we got you covered. Links, of course, are in the description. All right, so that leaves us with our last phase of self-learning on this creative journey here. And so where we started with the age of search, right? Just being curious, asking the right question, the power of asking the right questions and then using, you know, your knowledge and awareness of yourself to form your own personal plan to min max that, that learning time and that learning schedule and to get into that flow state to make the best of things. And then of course, analyzing everything that you're consuming in that first phase and, and now we're at articulation, right? Expressing that idea you, you have formed. That's what I struggled the most with for years. And it took me till I literally started this YouTube channel to um, make that work and to make that happen. It's why I did, because it started to let me know what I know and what I don't know. And I grew from it. And I grow from every video, every class I teach to this day, because I have to articulate something to, to a group or, or to somebody. But you know, teaching, that can be intimidating. It can be a little scary, but you don't have to necessarily teach, right? You can implement by performance. So you could simply keep an audio diary. You could keep a sketchbook. You could even write lots of notes. It's a great way of articulating all of your experiences to this point. But I do find, in a sense, right, when you are demonstrating to some individual or some audience, it is a great way to really test your growth or to measure your growth and test what you know, of course. So if we don't try things, we never do get that experience and we can't reflect upon something we have you know, never done. So if we're looking now you know, at this, this chart, um, the quality of input matters. And, and that's right at the top on our consumption, right? Where we're taking information in. So I do recommend, of course, to try to find a way to minimize distractions, get rid of the phone, shut off social media, disconnect even from the internet and YouTube when you're actually trying to learn that initial information. And then of course, when when I have to reflect on things, I'm always asking what was the most useful. I keep notebooks. I, I have one around, it's right here. It's absolutely filled 
with the notes that I take from videos and, and occasionally a book, but I do know I like personally learning from short, concise videos. And then I, of course, apply it by doing the work, doing the painting, doing the drawing, whatever, doing 3D in this case. And then, of course, I'm showing that, of course, with all the students in the various classes. And that is the output, right? So there's input, there's output. It's all part of that growth uh, cycle. And what I'm getting at is we it's really hard to learn just by watching. I watch a lot of cooking shows with my wife, and I can't cook that great. I definitely have a lot of mileage fit watching cooking shows, but I, I can grill steak and burgers. That, that That's the occasional thing that I could do. Or or uh, I watch a lot of karate movies and action films. I could just watch John Wick 4, but I couldn't win a gunfight, couldn't win a karate tournament. No, you, you, you really do learn by doing, of course. We need that implementation to really fortify it in our mind, I think, as human beings. Very few of us probably could get around that. So this is really about, you know, my journey, learning, and observing, right? Those are like the two sides of that coin, right? Equal parts experience and reflection. And whether we're observing our world, you know, we're observing others, we're observing one self, right? It's it's kind of like that that trifecta as well in the different stages. And I know a lot of us out there, and a lot of a lot of you creators can form some occasionally run into some kind of block out or art block or creative block whatever you want to call it and you get burnt out um that's often because you're lacking on some aspects of this trifecta most commonly i i would think it would be when you're not putting enough information into your mind in regards of like observation right whether it's referencing whether it's actually real life experiences you know like where you're going on a trip and you're traveling or you're just sharing in a relationship with another human being and you know just experiencing life if you're just kind of grinding out at the computer and you never leave your place and you're just playing lots of like call of duty and stuff like in warcraft it or have this or have a sustainable amount of creativity uh jake parker one of my favorite kind of creative uh, individuals on this platform right he calls it your creative bank account if you're constantly just trying to output you know this information you do drawing and painting and you're not making a deposit coming in right that you're going to experience that burnout and you're going to find a lack of creativity and inspiration for sure and i wanted to just before this video gets too long go into my bonus tip and it's on observation thematically here, of course. And what I was taught um, is when observing something, and what, what, what I'm talking about here is this will set you up to kind of start to find your style and it will help you find, uh, you know, how to extract certain bits of information in a very specific way. So let's look at a pretty broad, typical example here from Blade Runner, Blade Runner screenshot. This image could be anything. It could be a picture from your favorite artist. It could be a character. It could be environment. It, it could be a scene. It doesn't matter. But what a lot of students t in my classes tend to do is when they're describing work, and th these I'm talking about in the earlier weeks, when they have to self learn to start self-directing themselves and put labels on their goals and objectives. A lot of students either name things that are too broad or too specific. So when we're observing information, in this case from the screenshot here, we want to avoid topics or labels on this like cyberpunk or futuristic or that it's dark and that there might be a sense of mystery there. Why Why not those? Why are they too broad? Well, cyberpunk and futuristic are very loose terms and they mean very different things to a lot of different people. And if we had to make another sequence of images, you know, that are capturing the essence of what this image is trying to portray, it, it would just go out of control too fast. Similarly, right, with being too specific, things like cityscapes, nighttime, snow, or maybe loneliness, they're 
too specific to fundamentally be useful long term if this were like a, pro a project because what if the next image we had to design or the next part of a project didn't have a cityscape or what if a scene in this movie was not at nighttime do you see like it doesn't really help us so what we want to do is a apply art and design kind of lingo and talk to find a middle ground um, and and this is my uh, takeaway from these right and and these are the big five ingredients you want to try to apply when you know ob observing any kind of subject for your study right I, technique the subject itself color emotion and the tools so i was trying to think okay with the technique on this there's a lot of hard shapes everything kind of feels sturdy and dynamic the subject right it's very cinematic it's film noir genre the colors always kind of monochromatic but very deliberately so. Nothing's random. It's all delicately placed. Emotion, right? Everything does feel pessimistic. There's a bleakness to it. And of course, because it uses a lot of brutalist architecture, everything is imposing, right? Tools, and this could be literally like a literal medium if we're observing like a, a charcoal drawing or an oil painting, like information like that would be helpful if we're trying to recreate it. But here things are cinematic, right? They're ethereal. They're very atmospheric and, of course, very stark lighting. So, right, like it, it's a it's a sweet spot where we try to use as much artistic knowledge as we can to dissect that observation. So, see, like if we just kind of apply a few other images from the the films, like again, a lot of these won't necessarily fit into the too broad or too specific. Some will, but the the sweet spot would help us, like if we're going if we're thinking more broadly in terms of like a project scope or we're developing our style. So yeah, these are the tools that I use to self-learn and educate all the time. And uh, yeah, sorry, the video went on a little bit too long there. So guys, thank you of course for watching. If you made it to this point, I just wanted to make a good video to share some of the experiences I had as both a student and now as you know professional instructor. And there's enough kind of common attributes, as I mentioned in the beginning, between the artists that really do excel and those that are fizzling out. So if you are serious about growth in your own artistic journey, I can't recommend enough to take it very seriously, to just show up, put the work in, slow down, as my best students do, and ask you know as many questions as you can, you know whether it's to an instructor me or otherwise, whether it's to a more senior member of a Discord group, but you know, the act of just slowing down, analyzing, and then you know, even articulating what you're learning, even to, even to someone less experienced or as skilled as you, it's it gonna make the whole <laughs> world go around. We're gonna make the art community better and stronger, of course, than ever. So I hope to catch you guys in the next video. Of course, let me know what topics you want me to see covered and let me know below. I'll be happy to start drafting out some plans to make sure we cover all our grounds here. Catch you guys next time.